Hello and welcome to Africa, this enormous and astonishing continent. South Africa, to be more precise, just a short drive outside Johannesburg. And I'm here to talk to a remarkable man, Credo Mutwa. When I first came to South Africa about 18 months ago, within two or three days, I was introduced to Credo Mutwa. I'd never heard of him at the time, but from the moment I met him, I didn't stop listening and he didn't stop talking for at least five hours. And within the first few minutes, I realized I wasn't just in the presence here of a man of great knowledge, and he's certainly that. I was in the presence of a genius, a unique human being. And Credo Mutwa is without doubt the most incredible man it has been my honor to meet. When the white man started destroying our religion, when he started demonizing our gods, when he started ridiculing what we believed in and actually using educated Africans to destroy that ancient African religion, in many parts of Africa, say, our ancient religion went underground. And there were, call them secret societies, all over South Africa and Central Africa and East Africa and West Africa, where this knowledge was, was stored. I found that the mission schools had been teaching me lies about my people all along. Missionaries had told us as children that the only light came to Africa with white people. That before the white men came, we black people had no idea about God. We had no belief in a life after death. And that our people were just a race of savages who used to lie around in the sun, womanize, fight, and drink beer every day. I was suddenly awakened to the fact that Africa, Africans had in fact been far greater intellectually than the missionaries were, were willing to give them credit for that like the white men, we had astrology, astronomy, we had surgery. In fact, I found that Zulu surgeons in the early years of the 19th century and the 18th century and even beyond could perform operations which white surgeons were not capable of operating. Um, my own researchers uh, around the world has certainly focused in on the fact that there is a force not of this world, shall we say, that is the common theme. What is your experience and your knowledge of an extraterrestrial involvement in the history of Africa? One of the most secret stories that was revealed to me sir, is about these beings. This story was revealed to me first in Barotsident, then in the country today called Rwanda, once known as Rwanda Urundi. Then I learned about this story at that time on the foothills of Mount Kilimanjaro. This is the story, a story you find throughout Africa. There was once a time when the blue sky was invisible, when the whole world was covered with mist, when you could not see the sun as it is now, 
you only saw it as a, a, a splash of white light moving slowly across the sky. At that time, there was an eternal drizzle every day of the year. At that time, people could not see the stars. People only saw the trees growing, trees which were very, very big. There was no desert at that time, only jungle everywhere where you went. At that time, say, people were what we call in Zulu, Nungubili. A human being was both male and female in one body. And out of the sky, one day, came terrible objects. They were like gigantic bows made of huge gleaming gold. They were shaped like bows without strings, and they were bigger than the biggest mountains. They came out of the sky, bringing great noise, black smoke, and fire with them. And out of those huge objects came them. At that time, sir, Human beings could not speak. We had no gift of language at that time. And people had, however, great mental power. A man would go into the bush and using the power of his mind, actually call out an animal which he wanted to hunt and kill for his children and the animal would appear and kneel down before the man, and the man would kill the animal and take it home. But when the Chitawuli arrived in Africa, they told our people that they were gods and that they were going to give us human beings great gifts on one condition we had to worship them and accept them as our creators. Some told our people that they were our elder brothers and that this earth had produced them generations ago. The Chitauri said, if you serve us, you wretched little human beings, we are going to make you into gods. And the human beings agreed to serve the Chitauri. And the Chitauri gave human beings a second gift, the gift of language. People started talking with their tongues where they had talked with their minds before. And there was a big rubbish starting again because this man did not know the language of that man. And when this man greeted that man, this man thought that he was being insulted and saw a lot of murder and culpable homicide starting taking place all over the world. When our people were given language, they found to their horror that they had lost much of their mental powers. They had paid a terrible price. But the Chitauri were now the masters of human beings. They made them the, the human beings to go into holes in the ground and to mine metal, gold, copper, tin, all kinds of metal the Chitauri forced our people to mine. And the people were very unhappy because they couldn't they couldn't, uh, 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 they couldn't cope with the new sexual differences which were there now between men and women. 
And then from amongst the, 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 the Chitauri came a very good female Chitauri. Her name was Mai Mzarantwari Samahongo. My Mzarantwari Samahongo was the senior wife of the terrible chief of the Chitauri, Umbaba Gorontwari Samahongo. She was sorry for human beings, this great reptile lady. She said to the poor people, Ow, you are unhappy. And the people said, Yes, great one. We go into the holes every day, we dig the stones and we bring it to the gods. But we are not happy. And my Zarantwari scratched her scaly chin and began to think and to think. She was terribly ugly. Her eyes were awful, like lights in the darkness. But she had mercy in her heart. And she taught the men and the women how to make love. And she said, look, we, we divided you into males and females. Now this action is going to bring you together. Ah, but it did not. Because anyone who receives a gift from the Ntwari, the children of the python, is always in trouble. We're looking from my research and staggeringly hearing uh, you talk, you're saying exactly the same as I've come across. It's an incredible confirmation that a reptilian race from another world has been behind the manipulation of humanity for a very, very long time. Now, what do these Chittahuli actually look like, the reptiles? I'm not a good artist, sir. You're better than me, that's for sure. But this is how we believe the cheetah would look like. They were created in this. You, you see, sir, you white people say that there are alien beings on this earth. No, you are wrong. The earth in which we live has produced 24 different races during its long existence. Please, this is how a Chitauri looks like. It stands about 11 feet high. It is a very slender being, which seems not to have a bone structure. Its, its fingers have no joints. They are more like, they are more as if the bones in here were flexible. It, uh, some of the Chitauri have got three claws with a thumb. Some have got six claws with a thumb. And some of the Chitauris have got horns on their heads. And what surprises me is this. Some film producers, like the producers who, who make the film Star Wars, often show creatures in their films which actually exist, which even the most uneducated of Africans who knows this Chitauli can identify. For example, in the new Star Wars film, what is it called? Star Wars or something like that. There is a creature who amazes me called Darth Maul. Darth Maul is a red and black being with a ring of small horns right round his head. That is exactly what the Chitawuli look like. Some have got ordinary heads 
without any horns on their on their on their heads. These are the lesser chitaul, but the royal chitaul have got a ring of sharp horns all around their heads, and the very high chitaul, like their king, Mubaba Samahongo, they have got very long horns which grow this way. Not that way like a bull, but this way like certain antelopes. Now, I wonder, I just wonder where these film producers get their information from. And in in one strange feeling, which my student told, called me to come and watch, was a, a the thing called Stargate Two, mm -hmm. and in that feeling, there was a creature, a very slimy, cream-colored creature with the heavy wrinkles on its face. It was a spitting likeness of Mubaba Samahongo, the terrible emperor of the Chitaul. Well, clearly there's a tremendous amount of, of knowledge um, of what's been going on and what is going on, which comes out symbolically through uh, films and areas of uh, communication like um, Hollywood. But the thing that I, I'm totally stunned the more I, I talk to you about this is because I've been uh, all over the world having people give me descriptions of seeing um, uh, reptilian type figures, particularly people in positions of power in the world, uh, changing into a reptilian figure and coming back again. And what they describe seeing is exactly what the knowledge of ancient Africa talks about seeing. We're talking about the same people there, which is an astonishing uh, confirmation. It, and the eyes is something that keeps coming up being described. Yes. Tell me about the eyes of the Chittahuli. Say, a warrior Chittahuli has got eyes like a snake. These eyes are yellowish with split pupils and they glow in darkness. So if a Chittahuli, a warrior Chittahuli, one of the lesser lesser classes is hiding in a cave. You can see its eyes burning. But a royal Chitauri has got three eyes. It's got the yellow eyes, which glow in a strange, almost ice-like way, like jewels, like certain types of yellow jewel. And then they have got an eye in the center of their foreheads, an eye which doesn't close up down like a normal eye does, but which closes from side to side and which opens this way. Now, this eye of the Chitaur is the eye that kills because it can knock a man down just by the fire the glare that comes out of it. Is this where the um, a constant recurring theme of the evil eye comes from? Yes, sir. yes. Sir. In fact, Mubaba, the emperor of the, of the Chitauri, who is said to be still alive today, Mubaba has got a central eye. His other two eyes were stitched shut by a jealous wife. But his killing eye, the Samahongo, the terrible red eye, opens. He can even open it like this. Mr. David, I would like to share a little thing with you. It is this. The best way to protect an evil thing is to deny its existence. And if you talk about things such as the Chitauri, if you talk about things such as the Mandinda, 
There are many people who say to you, rubbish, this thing does not exist. Now, in this way, this great evil is protected. Uh, my research, uh, very clearly, um, uh, and again, you're right, there's tremendous denial that this is the fact. Um, even among conspiracy researchers, there's tremendous denial that the Chittahuli, the reptilians, and the Illuminati are actually the same thing. Exactly the same. Because amongst my people, we say that when two Chittahuli are challenging each other for power, and they must fight a duel with their terrible eyes, they start glowing like fishes deep in the, in the sea. And the f faster they glow, the angrier they, they, they are said to be. Now that is why there are certain parts of Africa where people are advised not to walk at night because that is where the Chitauri often fight. And one of these parts of Africa, say, is a remarkable place called the Mountains of the Round Rocks, Matobo, wrongly pronounced Matopo in, in Zimbabwe. These hills are really not remarkable in themselves. These hills are are said to be the one place in Africa where the Chitauri have been seen. And these hills is where Cecil John Rhodes lies buried, but there is more. You must visit this place at one time. Amongst the rocks on the Matopo Mountains, you find a species of lizard which you don't find anywhere in Africa or the world. A species of lizard which responds to the call of a human being. When I first arrived in 1958 in the land called Rhodesia, now known as Zimbabwe, I found an African there who was a tourist attraction. He was a game warden who made strange sounds, calling out, wah, 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 wah. and as he called out, these strange lizards, the only type of lizard anywhere on earth which responds to, to the human voice, used to come out of cracks and out of holes in the ground and to gather around this African. And it was this African game warden who told me that the, sh the sounds he is making are not just noise, they are the speech of the Chitauri star gods. Isn't it a staggering coincidence that Cecil Rhodes, one of the greatest Illuminati frontmen, uh, perhaps of, 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 certainly of modern times, who did so much to imprison Africa, should choose to be buried at the point where this is all going on. You see, sir, Cecil John Rhodes went his way into the hearts of Africans and in their despair, wise men of the Mashona people, wise men of Matebele people tried to make Cecil John Rhodes one of them. They told him about the secrets of the Matopo Mountains, that under the Matopo Mountains lies a city, a city of great wisdom, which is the home of the last survivors of the Chitauri god beings in that part of Africa. And if you go to the Matopo Mountains and you carry a four pound hammer and you strike certain parts of that landscape with that hammer, it gives out a hollow sound which shows you that there are caverns deep underground there. There are two sets of mountains. 
there is the Matopo Mountains, and then to the east of Zimbabwe, there are the great mountains known as the Inyangani, the Weeping Moon Mountains. There, even now, people disappear without trace. Sometimes a person would disappear for several days and reappear a few days later, not knowing where he had been or where she had been. And white people have disappeared there. Black people in their thousands have disappeared there. It was there that I also went missing for four days in 1959 in one of the most traumatic experiences of my life. What happened? Well, it's a long story, sir. My teacher, Elizabeth Moyo, had sent me to get a special herb which grows only on the foothills of those mountains. It was just an ordinary day like any other, just a beautiful day like this one outside here. And I, I love the African wilderness. I'm at home in the bush, especially in the days when I was still in good health. I love the animals, I, still, I love the, their smell, and I love the smell of the vegetation. And I was looking for this herb when all of a sudden a, a bright blue mist fell all around me. It took me some time to react to this strange thing. It was a hot day and all of a sudden the temperature around me dropped. It was as if I was on the slope of a very cold mountain, but it was a warm day. And then the next moment, I was in what appeared to be a metal-lined tunnel, a caving tunnel. And I was lying on what looked like a workbench, a very large uh, workbench of some kind. You know, a, an iron table, which, uh, uh, an engineer or somebody working with metal would use to, as for welding and cutting metal upon. But this workbench was very brightly polished. And there I was lying there with my trousers missing and only my khaki shirt when I saw again through what appeared to be like blue mist a number of moving objects which at first I thought were dolls and these objects were moving towards me. I noticed to, with mild surprise that they were very thin, short, human-like creatures with very, very large melon-shaped heads the creatures had no noses they, like human, as human beings have. They had only small little holes on either side of where the nose would be. And their mouths were like knife cuts at the bottom of their faces. And these creatures were coming towards me. In color, they were gray like certain... Uh, types of fish and they wore silvery gray garments which reached up to their necks and up to their wrists. I couldn't see whether they were wearing boots or not at that time. And while I was looking at these creatures, I suddenly was aware that something was above me standing there and I looked up straight into the face of one of them, a much taller one than the others. And this creature was wearing a garment, like a tight-fitting overall, without any buttons or anything, which reached up to its neck, but its wrists were bare. I noticed that the creature said, 
had very long fingers. Its fingers had extra, uh, and each of its fingers had an extra joint, and it ended in a claw, a black claw like that of a, a chicken or a certain kind of bird, and that its thumb was not here, but here in the middle of the hand. And this thing was standing above my head and looking down at me, and I was looking at its eyes, which were very strange indeed. It was as if it was wearing plastic goggles over its eyes. I could see its eyes inside these tinted goggles, and it had holes on either side here, but it had no nose as I have. Its jaws were very small, and its mouth was a slit with tiny little scale-like things where its lips should be. And the creature carried a horrible smell on its... I can't describe that smell. It was a metallic, chemical smell like, which seemed to combine the smell you would smell when somebody is burning brass or copper, and a very ugly chemical smell, these two smells combined. And this creature was looking down at me. I was frightened, but I could not move. And the next thing I knew was a terrible pain on my left thigh. It was as if somebody had just stabbed me right to the bone. I screamed and I tried to jump away, but my body was, my body was inactive. I could not move. I was not tied to any chain. I was not chained to the top of this table. There was no belt tying me, but I could not move my body. And when I looked down at what was happening, I found that one of the shorter creatures had driven something very painful into my left thigh. And then, while I watched, horrified, the creature pulled out this thing, and I saw that it was like a pencil made of shining metal with what appeared to be a flexible uh, uh, cable at the back. And before I could do anything, sir, my head was seized by the creature above me. It caught me on either side of the head like, like this. And then a fourth, a Second, third creature drove something into my right nostril here. It was as if I had been shot. The pain was so terrible sir, that I screamed and screamed. Blood filled my mouth. Blood spattered out of the nostril. And the creature did not seem to care. I was, I was stupefied. The pain was so intense, so terrible. And then, quietly, brutally, the creature pulled out the thing that it had stabbed in me in the nose with, and blood flowed into my mouth, into, 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 out of my nostril, and I was choking. And then the big creature coldly turned my head this way so that blood came out of the mouth and which gave me some kind of relief. And after what seemed like an eternity of pain, the, the creature brought something out of somewhere which looked, it looked like a, an old-fashioned tea strainer in appearance, and it put this thing close to my nose. And then 
I seemed to drift away and the pain subsided. You know, sir, it was torture so intense that even now I can't describe it. And after that, sir, I was left alone, except for the big creature which stood to one to my right side this time with its arms folded looking down at me. And then, while I was looking at this creature, trying to appeal to it, no pain anymore, no pain, please, I was pleading. Pictures suddenly flooded my mind. Pictures of buildings sunk in a red, in a red lake of, of water. Buildings rotting away. Buildings that appeared as if they had been bombed. And cities sunk in terrible mud. Trees sticking out like rotten ghosts. Trees without leaves, without branches sticking out of the mud as if they had been poisoned. I saw visions of this. And then, through an entrance which I had not seen before, came a strange and terrible being. It was exactly like this. It was tall, made entirely of metal, with burning eyes and a snout. It didn't do anything. It just moved and came to stand at my left side. It didn't touch me or anything like that. It just stood there, making a strange humming sound. Wow, 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 like that. Then the creatures took me out of that room after the metal creature and this pink creature had gone. This creature took me out of that room, assisted by another one, and they pushed me along a corridor which curved slowly in that direction, in, in the, towards my right. And there I was shown many things which even today I don't understand. I was shown little versions of this creature swimming in huge cylinders of what made out of what looked like glass in a pink, pinkish liquid like ugly little, ted, little frogs inside the liquid. They looked like, like aborted human fetuses. They were very, very terrible and disgusting. And then we came to another room and there I saw a number of people undergoing the same torture that I had undergone. One particular person who, whom I passed very close to was a white man, definitely a European, with a yellowish beard and moustache and long straggly blood, blood crusted hair. This man looked into my eyes and I looked into his eyes and we were so, so close we were as I went past him. Then, to cut a long story short, I found myself in the bush again. But, but, I was wearing only my shirt. My boots were gone and so was my trousers. So I took off my shirt and wore it around my waist as a, a, a loincloth. And I started traveling, not knowing really in which direction I was going. Then I came to a track and I walked along that and some time later, I saw people coming towards me. It was a group of young men and young women, Mashona people, and they were going to a trading store 
I later learned. I asked them where Elizabeth Moyo's homestead was, and they directed me to it. But they kept a safe distance away from me, and later I, I learned why. I was carrying a horrible, non-human smell upon me. When at long last I came to Mrs. Moyo's village, all the dogs in that place went hysterical. They came at me in a pack, wanting to tear me to pieces. And only the villagers managed to save my life there. Mrs. Moyo asked me where I had been, and I said I did not know. And then she said, I know you, have, you had been taken by the little ones. I said, yes, I cannot understand. She said, you must not try to understand. You were chosen by the gods as a living sacrifice. So don't even try to talk about this. But how could I not talk about it? I wanted to understand what had been done to me, by whom and why. Even now, said, I still want to understand what it was all about. And many years later, I met a remarkable white woman, Elizabeth Clara, a famous South African woman who had worked for British intelligence during the war and who we are told had been impregnated by a being from the stars, Akko. I asked Elizabeth what, what was the meaning of the strange thing which was done to me. Because since that time, I had come across many black people, well over 200, who had been through the same torture as I. I had come across many black as well as Cape colored women who had been mysteriously impregnated by the same creatures that I had gone through the hands of. And let me tell you one other interesting thing sir, before I forget. About a year after I had underwent this terrible experience. I was walking along Jeppe Street in Johannesburg, delivering parcels, when a white man shouted at me to stop. I stopped. I thought he was a policeman wanting to arrest me for some reason. And when I tried to produce my identity document, the white man said, listen, I don't want your nasty word, passbook, kefa. I said, then sir, what do you want, boss? He said, listen, where did I see you? Where did I see you? I said, I don't know, boss. But I, he looked very familiar to me. Where did you and I meet? Then I said to him, I saw you in Rhodesia, in a certain place. You were lying on a table. If I had hit that white man with a fist, he would not have reacted the way he did. He went pale, almost dirty gray in appearance, and he turned away with a terrible dirty word, and he walked away. His eyes were filled not with anger, sir, but with pure naked terror. Astonishing story. I have had personal experience of these. And there are people who claim that these creatures are gods. There are people, sir, who claim that these creatures are experimenting on us. That is a lot of rubbish. These creatures are harvesting us. 
these creatures are not aliens, Mr. Ike. These creatures are sexually compatible with our women. And what does that tell you? It tells you that they came from here. They are, they are, they are part of us. And this makes them all the more dangerous. They know us very, very, very well. They know the great weaknesses of our minds, just as they know the great strengths of our minds. They operate in, in what I call the gray area of human existence, that, that side of our lives which we don't want to acknowledge the existence of. They create, African tradition says that the Chitawuli where, where, where they engaged God himself in a terrible war and God defeated them, the real God, Ngulungul, the creator. God defeated them and he closed their mouths so that they are unable to talk or to eat food anymore. But we are told, say, that the Chitawuli fatten on the energy that we human beings give them. They make us to fight each other. And when the whole land is drowning in death and fear and terror, when hundreds and hundreds of people are angry and afraid, the cheetah will get fat because they eat that, that what we call the dark power, which is brought about when human beings destroy the planet on which they live. There are mysteries in this world that we as thinking human beings must look into. And one of these mysteries is this. There is overwhelming evidence of the fact that before Africa was actually colonized by the white people from Europe, it was first prepared by strange people for this colonization. When the first Portuguese ships started sailing around the Cape of Good Hope, strange beings appeared amongst our people, strange human-like creatures, usually creatures of great height, abnormally tall, human-like beings, some of them with only one foot, appeared amongst our people, and they started doing things there which, which made it easier for the colonialists to invade us and to conquer us. What were they like in terms of their color and skin, Prada? Say, we do not know, but there are those who described them as very, very white, chalk white in appearance. <coughs> this went on for so often that it became traditional to our people to represent these beings with white chalk. You found masks amongst our, our mask makers which were smeared entirely in white chalk to represent these creatures. These creatures were usually about eight feet tall, very, very slender, 
and they used to wear robes made of the, the tanned hides of certain type of antelope, usually the, the intensely black sable antelope. What, what name did the uh, people give to them? We gave them the, 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 the name Izilo Zengubo, the beasts of the terrible blanket. These creatures were dressed exactly like Christian monks, with hoods and long robes. In fact, I will draw you a likeness of one of them, as it is shown in a rock painting. Now, these creatures used to live in holes in the ground, or in 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 uh, 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 underground uh, uh, in underground caverns or in 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 gullies over which a roof of logs and and vegetation as well as swords was placed and it may be of interest to you sir, that Portuguese explorers and Portuguese sea men used to see these one-legged creatures hopping about and sometimes disappearing into the ground as if by magic. And these creatures were called by the Portuguese sailors monopods. They wore a long robe that reached down to their ankles, and they appeared as they moved through the bush as if they only had one leg. Monopods were seen in Africa, and they were also seen in America before America was colonized by the white people. Among the Native Americans? Yes, sir. The, one of the <coughs> one of the things that amazed me is that the story of America and the story of Africa was the same. It is said say, that these monopoles introduced certain knowledge to our people. They actually prepared our people mentally for what was to come. For example, these monopods, these uh, beasts of the terrible blanket, used to wear a cross-like ornament on their chests as a charm, a cross made of either gold or silver. Doesn't it amaze you that when the Native Americans saw the cross painted on the on the sails of Christopher Columbus's ships, they recognized it as a sacred object. Let me tell you, sir, exactly the same happened in South Africa where our people were made familiar with the cross long before the white man set foot in Africa. And when our people saw this cross, this time brought by missionaries, they recognized it as a sacred object in other ways. Now, I don't know how to put this there, but can you put it for me? Our people were prepared long beforehand to, to recognize certain Christian symbol and Judaic symbols. And when they saw them in the hands of the colonists later, they saw them for what they were. This is one of the reasons why, Mr. Ike, 
Africans accepted and protected Christian missionaries even while fighting a life and death struggle against white colonialism. How is it that a man would accept the religion of an invader while at the same time fighting a life and death battle against the encroachments that this invader was making into his native land? This happened in America and this happened in Africa and the the, the, the sources of this uh, 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 acceptance were the same. We must understand that there will come a time when the damage will have become so great, will have gone so far that we will not be able to reverse it. But I believe in this power thing of the great African proverb that goes Mudimu Upala Baloi God is greater than all the wizards and sorcerers on this earth. And I know that if as many people as possible are aware of what the Chitauli are doing, the Chitauli will be forced to retreat. Already, there are signs that they are getting desperate. Why? Because the human being is trying to bring out the God within itself. We are trying to become gods, and we are succeeding. It's only a few decades ago when there was no one on this earth who knew or cared anything about animal conservation, who knew or cared anything about the protection of the environment. But today, sir, there are thousands of such people worldwide. It is a hopeful sign, a sign that should be encouraged. Let the power of light shine in the dark corners of conspiracy and as it shines let humankind be saved Credo Mutwa the most remarkable man it's been my privilege to meet and when you look at Credo Mutwa you're looking at an unbelievable example of the true power of the human spirit his life has been a series of astonishing challenges from the moment he was born right to today as threats on his life continue, threats to his wife's life continue. And these challenges would have broken the spirit. Just a few of them would have broken the spirit of most other people on this planet, but they've not broken him. Here he is talking to you, revealing information that has largely never been revealed before through these sources because the pressure on him has been to keep quiet, keep the secrets. But as Credo said, Africa is dying. As a place of freedom, the earth is dying. It's time for people to know. Now this man has got the guts to stand up and speak out despite condemnation from virtually all sides. So what are we going to do? Are we going to say, oh, that's interesting. Oh, well, yeah, Credo Mutua is interesting, you know. Light a candle or dismiss it. Oh, he's just a witch doctor. He's got nothing to say. In other words, are we going to find some excuse now to do nothing? To sit on our backsides and think someone else will do it or there's nothing we can do? Or are we going to express the spirit that this guy is expressing? 